Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Krishnan, this is Chris. Hi. Um, Chris, uh, we are now six months old yeah. since this whole thing exploded. When you think back to the moment where this went public, what was going through your mind? What were you trying to explore? What were you trying to um, expose? Yeah, so I think looking at a bit of the history of um, Cambridge Analytica is helpful. So uh, Cambridge Analytica came out of a company that I used to work for called SCL Group. And SCL was a military contractor uh, for the Ministry of Defense in the UK, for the Pentagon in the United States, and militaries all around the world. And when I first got brought on to SCL Group, Cambridge Analytica didn't exist. Steve Bannon wasn't in the picture. Um, the project that I was uh, initially working on was in uh, looking at how we can use information and data um, to profile people in the context of national defense. And it's important for people to understand the original context of a lot of the research that led to Cambridge Analytica. When you work on military projects or projects intended to be military research, right? If you are, if you are combating ISIS, the agency of that person, the agency of your target is not, is not a consideration, right? So if you are trying to interfere with a recruitment network, if you are trying to interfere with a communications network of an extremist organization and you're using profiling and you're using targeting to do that, you, it is fair game to use disinformation. It is fair game to interfere with the communications of those people because they are seeking to harm people. The problem became when, and it's sort of a funny story because one of our clients um, who at the time was working for the US Air Force was on a plane and he was sitting next to a guy uh, who worked for Steve Bannon and they were just chit-chatting on this plane. What do you do? Oh, I work in you know, US Cyber Command, da 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 What do you do? I work in politics. And from this conversation on a plane, um, th this guy who worked for Steve Bannon got introduced to SCL Group. And SCL, um, being a sort of a, a mili military contractor, appealed to Steve Bannon because at the time, he was running Breitbart. And when you look at why Breitbart was founded. Andrew Breitbart, before he died, he said, politics exists downstream from culture. So if you want to change anything, change culture. And Steve, when he was looking at you know, Breitbart, it was kind of failing because you know, what was originally supposed to be this grand sort of monument to cultural change became sort of a glorified hate blog for white dudes who can't get laid. And he he was seeking to find a new arsenal of tools to wage a cultural war. And when Steve Bannon talks about culture war, he says it pointedly. He means war. And when you think about warfare, what do you need? You need an arsenal. And in culture war, your arsenal of weaponry is information, and your targeting systems are algorithms, just in the same way that a missile has a payload and a targeting system. In information operations and warfare, you've got the same thing, except instead it, your payload is information and your targeting system is an algorithm. And he went to SCL and looked at some of the projects uh, that were being done and it appealed to him. And so he introduced the firm to Robert Mercer, who is uh, a computer scientist by training, a billionaire, made all of his money uh, by building algorithms in finance. And you know, he looked at this what we were doing and wanted to acquire uh, the company and bought the company. And so all of a sudden, we had a situation where on one hand, we start working on a project in one sense, and all of a sudden, it gets acquired, and it becomes something very, very, very different. And when you look at what the alt-right is and what the role of Cambridge Analytica was in catalyzing the alt-right, it's an insurgency. It was built to be an insurgency. People who were vulnerable to disinformation were profiled and targeted using the same kinds of techniques and tactics the military would use against ISIS. And those people were brought onto Facebook groups or pages because what the company realized is that Facebook's algorithms uh, were, at least at the time, very sensitive. So if you brought people to alt-right pages, the news feed would change. And Facebook would do half of the work for you. Um, and when those people would join groups, when they would join pages, 
they would then develop relationships with people who may or may not have existed about things that were possibly or possibly untrue. And that was used as, uh, as the basis to create a movement. Because once these groups reach a certain threshold, even a couple thousand if it was in a local county, right? You take even 5% of those groups and you say, hey, hey, why don't you come to you know, a local coffee shop and meet just regular Joes like you, talk about all the things that you're not hearing on the media. And all of a sudden, you, know, you put like even just 50 people in a coffee shop and boom, these people think like the entire community thinks like this. And when I look at CNN or when I look at NBC or whatever, and I'm not seeing any of the things that everybody in my community is talking about, or whenever I go onto Facebook, I see everywhere, left, right, and center. It's because they're fake news. They're trying to hide stuff from me. And then you have a company that starts whispering into these people's ears. When you think that thing and you stop yourself from saying it because you think it's racist, maybe you shouldn't. Maybe you're just being realistic about race. Maybe there's a thing to this. Maybe it's just you can't say it because you know, these people are trying to keep you down or they're taking your job. And this entire company started fracturing American society in the same way that you would fracture a terrorist organization and treating voters like terrorists. And when I saw that happening, I left. And the first thing that happened when I left is I got sued. I got sued by a billionaire. I got sued by Steve Bannon and the whole company. They made me sign an NDA and put very large stakes for me coming out. And this was just uh, before the, the 2016 uh, election started getting into, into full swing. And so the first thing that I did is I, I went to um, uh, some contacts that I had in, at the time, the Obama administration, told them about what was happening. This data all went to Russia, by the way. You know, after Facebook, and by the way, Facebook authorized this, they, the, the applications that, that Cambridge Analytica set up went through Facebook's approval process and they authorized it. They knew exactly what was happening. That data then went to a Russian researcher in Russia who was also working on Russian state-funded projects on, on how uh, uh, psychological profiling can be used uh, using online data, right, in St. Petersburg. And so uh, Facebook, Facebook knew about it. They, didn't, they knew about it from the beginning, and they did nothing about it. I, I went to some people in the Obama administration, and they said, don't worry about you it. You tried to blow the whistle a couple of times, didn't you? I then, yes. And I, I, I then went to people in the Democratic Party, and I said, hey, so they're not doing anything about it. Maybe you should look at this. And they didn't do anything about it. Why? Because, yeah, Donald Trump's a slime bag. You know, Steve Bannon's a slime bag. But Hillary's going to win. But then that didn't happen. Um, and, you know, it was at that point um, you know, where I saw Steve Bannon, who is my old boss, walking into the White House uh, with Donald Trump and listening to the things, not only the things that he says in public, but thinking back to the things that he would say in private and go, this is fucked up. Um, and then, then learning that Cambridge Analytica was being given non-competitive tenders to uh, the American government, State Department, and the Pentagon, and I go, this is a company that is associating with Russian researchers that is taking tens of millions of data uh, surreptitiously from people on Facebook's watch. Facebook's not doing anything about it. And now you want to send them into the Pentagon? It's like they're, Steve was trying to create his own personal NSA and, and do things that, you know, would frankly undermine and fracture, and you know, he was in part successful at undermining and fracturing our society using disinformation, using targeting systems, using the same tactics the military would use. And so I decided to come out. I went to the police, I went to the authorities in Britain and in the United States, and when, when Facebook found out that the story was coming out, the first thing that they did is they threatened to sue The Guardian and Channel 4 and The New York Times saying it was defamatory and untrue. And then they send me a letter saying, you're the criminal here. We're going to, we're going to you know, you might have, you, you might have uh, you know, committed crimes and we, we're going to reserve our rights to report you to the FBI. And that, you know, when Facebook was then, and then later it turns out it's all true. And when Facebook's CTO was asked about it uh, at Parliament, Facebook's response was, why, why, why did you threaten to sue journalists when you knew it was all true? And they just said, Oh, we thought that was the done thing. We thought threatening people was just the done thing. You know, and here's the problem. Here's the problem, with, because Facebook, it, you know, 
It has so much power at its disposal. It is making a clone, a digital clone of our society. And when you look at how technology is evolving, uh, you know, five years down the road, 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, right, where you're putting all of your information into AI systems. And what happens when all those AI systems start connecting to one another, right? We've, we are starting to create an environment where we will lose agency well, because we, we have, the, the control of information, we are, we are devolving to these companies. We have to try and work out what are the lessons from your experience yeah. and of what, what has happened since and in terms of the authorities and investigative bodies' ability to get a handle on this so that we can work out what the lessons are for all of the people yeah. uh, here in this city right now who are working on all sorts of systems which gather data um, and, and have automation and AI and all of those sorts of things that, that are going to make this more of a problem. I mean, what, what do you think, six months on, um, the world has managed to accomplish in terms of holding people to account? Have the systems worked? Um. I, my journey as a whistleblower has also, I think, been a journey in understanding institutional failure. Um, we, we as a society have not come to appreciate what it is that we are doing. Um, you know, it's funny because I think back to, you know, for example, first contact between Europeans and indigenous people, right? And you have these people come on ships and they have their glittering steel, these large ships, they have guns, they have power, they must be divine messengers from the gods because look at all these things that they can do. But no, they were conquerors. They were there to seek to conquer and exploit resources. And when you look at you know, how we lionize a lot of these tech founders as almost divine with all their shiny glittering technology and not step, taking a step back and going, are we letting these companies colonize our societies? You know, when you look at Facebook's Free Basics program, for example, where all around the world, mostly in the global south, you know, it is, it is putting internet infrastructures all over so that it can mine data resources. And you look at how it doesn't do anything to, to stop disinformation where real consequences, like in Burma, where real consequences happen. People die because of disinformation. And why didn't they do anything about it? Because they didn't bother to have somebody who sp spoke Burmese in fucking Burma. And so, you, and this is, this, is, this is a story of colonialism. You know, the new Facebook is our generation's East India company, where it is going around and seeking to exploit people, and, it does, and whenever there's a problem, it seeks to devolve the consequences to someone else. And the problem is that our governments are not equipped to handle this. Well, that's the, we that's are the problem, so isn't behind. It? Because, I mean, you, you now are dealing and have given evidence to politicians on both sides of the Atlantic, and around the world. Yeah. I mean, do any of them get it? Do any of them understand? Or is their approach, this is just too much for us to handle. We can never catch up. Yeah, you know, I'll tell you, because I, I work with a lot of committees, House Intelligence Committee, Senate, the judiciary, judiciary Committee, all kinds in the United States. Um, I've had meetings with a lot of congressmen and women and senators, and the things that I get asked, in particular in private, are actually frankly concerning. Like, I've been asked, where in America do we store the internet? Like, I, and this is a person who is responsible for regulating these companies. I, get, you know, I, 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 I went into a meeting and there was a, a congressman there and he, he goes, you know, he jokes, uh, you know, oh, you know, I'm just an old guy, so you know my, my assistants handle the Twitter and the Facebook and all that. I don't understand any of this tech stuff. And I say, with respect, Congressman, imagine if you said, you know what, I'm an old guy. I'm too old to understand all this civil rights stuff. I'm too old to understand all this environment stuff. It's like, the internet matters, man. Like, you tell me a job that you can get without using the internet. Who's going to hire you if you say, I refuse to, be, I refuse to use Google? I refuse to use Facebook. I refuse to use LinkedIn because I want my privacy. I want to have the integrity and the agency to be able to make choices without being fucking warped, right? You can't. So I tell this guy, I say, look, man, it's not funny. You shouldn't joke about this because actually every single constituent of yours uses the internet every single day. You know, you eat three or four times a day. On average, you check your phone 150 times a day. Right? People literally go to bed with their phones. They sleep with their phones more than they sleep with people. Right? And like, like, 
it, there are no rules. I mean, when you, when you go to the doctor, do you feel safe? When you go to a grocery store and buy food, do you feel safe? When you step onto an airplane and literally sit in a metal tube as it hurtles through the air, do you feel safe? Most people do. Because regulation works. There are rules in place so to ensure safety. So you think it is possible? Safety. Absolutely. Absolutely. Why is it, we can if we can regulate nuclear power, why can't we regulate some fucking code? Right? Why can't we, why can't we institute design standards? Okay, I say this as somebody who works in fucking tech. Yet we, we need rules. And why is it that as a data scientist or as an engineer, I, you know, I sit in one of the only professions that doesn't have professional conduct standards, right? If you were an accountant, if you were a lawyer, if you were a doctor, if you were a nurse, if you were a teacher, you have a, a duty to follow an ethical code of conduct where you have to consider the ethical implications of your actions and behavior. And why is it that as a data scientist, where we are making things that people touch every single day, that they touch and touch them, that we don't have to consider the ethical and moral implications of what we're doing. I think that's absurd. Like, surely, 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 us as a profession, we're, people who work in tech, we are touching people's lives so intimately that we should have rules to make sure that we at least give due consideration to the impact that, uh, of the things that we build. But Otherwise, we're playing with fire and people get hurt. But when you think back to what you exposed, do you think the people behind it have got away with it so far? Well, so far, there hasn't been really any consequences. I mean, I, I'll, I'll give credit to the British Information Commissioner's Office because they, they instituted the largest fine by law that they were able to do, you know, a couple hundred thousand pounds. Nothing. Facebook still fought it, though. They lost the appeal, but they still fought it. They refused to even take a, that, some, a modicum of responsibility uh, for what they've done and what they're currently doing. Uh, but, you know, it's unfortunate because in the United States, for example, it's very difficult because there is no regulator. There is no authority. You know, when you sit with, you know, the, the closest thing is the FTC, which has sort of this weird opt-in consent decree, right? They have no powers. You know, yes, the FBI is looking into it. But, like, it's really complicated. You know, when you sit, the, the problem, one of the problems that I have is even when I go and I work with the police, the first, like, day or two of me sitting there doing interviews with, with policemen is just explaining, like, what software is, right? And these are people who, like, do tech crime, you know? How to do forensics. Like, the questions that I've gotten asked, it's like, what do you, you know, my lawyers joke, the, the only reason they, they keep calling me over is so they don't have to pay me a consulting fee, because most of the time it's just helping, it's sort of like mansplaining technology to people, right? And I, I, you know, I don't want to sound flippant about it because it's not actually funny when you think about it. It's not funny that our police are not equipped to handle data crime or tech crime. It's not funny that our politicians and our, and our parliaments and our legislators don't understand what the fucking internet is. So, so do we have to think beyond? I mean, what, what you said is, you know, we need rules. We need regulators and investigators and politicians who understand this stuff and who know what to do uh, about it. But you've also sounded the alarm about a new colonialism yeah. and, and about its impact on the world. We are here at an event celebrating the progress of the internet, the next stages of the internet, the new dreams. Yeah. Do you want to also sound an alarm yeah. to say to people, right. just stop and think about what you're doing? Yeah. I mean, imagine, you know, let's, let's look at the future, right? Everybody here is probably imagining the future. Okay, so we've got data being warehoused on people left, right, and center. And that's fine now because it's siloed, right? And so we look at it and go, oh, well, the only effects are just some, you know, bots and some ads, right? People aren't just, we are the first stages of putting AI into our homes, right? You've got Alexa and Google Home, and now Facebook has their random one, but they put a little privacy cover on it in case that you don't want them to spy on you. Um, but what happens then when that system gets literally built into your house, when your house starts to think about you, and, that how, and then your house is connected to your car, and your car is connected to the street, and the street's connected to your office, and everything starts talking to one another about you, thinking about you, 
making decisions for you, what you see, what you don't see. And also, when, the, when that AI has intentions, when that AI has motivations, it, will be, it is literally disrupting the meaning of being human when we stand in an environment that thinks about us and watches us and makes decisions and seeks to influence and correct our behavior. It's almost divine. And the problem is that we need, we are not, I mean, we're, we're like struggling to even talk about problems that happened years ago, let alone like the future where we might be creating our own sort of master, where our own environment and space dictates our, our very choices and perceptions of things. Um, and that's a huge, huge problem if that we're not thinking about it, you know? And, and uh, what, I, what I want to say to people is, give due consideration to what you do and what other people do uh, to, to, to our society and think forward. Just because you're working on one widget doesn't mean that that widget's not going to connect to another widget, and it's going to connect to another widget and another widget. And soon, lo and behold, we have an entire environment that is thinking and watching us. And for me, that is a bit scary, particularly when you look at the fact that Facebook and companies like Facebook don't do their job and don't give consideration to the ethical impacts of what they're doing. And you've got companies like Cambridge Analytica that go and work with Russians, that go and work with hostile foreign powers, that use surreptitious methods to go and corrupt people's minds. And then imagine that environment 20 years from now, where the whole fucking world is AI. And that's scary. And so what I'm trying to do is say, guys, think about it. Just think about it. And maybe we collectively, as people who work in tech, and you know, our legislatures and, and people more broadly in civil society can start a conversation about you know, what should the future be and what should we create and who, who, who is a stakeholder in that and who should, we, who should we be talking to and giving due consideration to as we're building these things. Just in the last minute, this has turned your life upside down yeah. and inside out. Was it worth it? I, yes, because th there is now a conversation about it. You know, change is slow. Change doesn't happen overnight. And, you know, I feel like I had a duty. I, I, I sat there in one of the largest uh, abuses of AI ethics, I think, that we've seen yet. And I felt like I had a duty to tell people about it. And at least now, that th now there's a conversation, and at least now I can go and speak to people here and all around the world, whether it's legislators or just regular people, and we can start thinking about it. And I think that's progress. Chris Wiley, thank you very much Cheers. indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you.